There's one title in the program and another on, on the uh, website, but I think a, best, a better title would be uh, Interruptive Practices as Technologies of Justice. And I think if there's a way that I could tie my paper to the first two papers in the panel, it might be to point out that something like free prior and informed consent, or in particular participatory mapping, which can be a part of that, could themselves be viewed as what I'm calling interruptive practices. So I'm going to begin with something that Delgamook said during his opening statement in the Delgamook versus British Columbia case. He asserted, quote, we do not seek a decision as to whether our system might continue or not. It will continue, end of quote. This declaration asserts sovereignty, but it also voices a view about time. My sense is that your typical judge or settler subject can hear the assertion of sovereignty, but not the idea about time. That's probably because it's easier to see indigenous land claims as claims about justice than it is to see them as claims about time, in part because settler subjects are too confident that they know what time is and that it is only one thing. I'm going to explore what's wrong with that confidence today because I think it opens up possibilities for interrupting some of the settled thought patterns of settler colonial subjects. I'm pursuing this line of thought because I think it is a technology of justice. It's one thing for courts to make rulings and truth commissions to issue recommendations. It's another thing entirely for an entrenched worldview to shift such that what was once viewed as an unquestionable structure of the world is experienced by people who benefit from that structure as an inexcusable form of domination. What I mean is, what would it take for settler, settler colonial subjects to see, to really see and hear and feel, their implication in ongoing injustice? I'll assert my belief that institutions cannot accomplish this on their own. And that's why I want to spend a bit of time thinking about how to create interruptive moments. I'm aware that a lot has been written and said about the Delgamook and other land cl claims cases by people who know a lot more about the history of law and indigenous groups in Canada than I do. So thinking about myself as a philosopher from the United States, a settler colonial subject, I, I asked myself, what could I contribute to this panel on law, process, indigenous rights? And so I think I'm going to um, limit, limit myself to some reflections about what can hurt, be heard in a courtroom, what can't be heard there and how we might interrupt some of our ideas about process in order to better advance uh, rights. And I'm going to do this in five short sections. The first section is called Common Sense. Cases like Delgamook inhabit a zone where law passes judgment on the passing of time and in doing so enacts one temporality rather than another, all without acknowledging that it has the power to do that. We might call this temporal privilege. If citizens of land that was taken from earlier inhabitants do not feel implicated in an ongoing injustice, how does that denial become possible, and what makes it able to continue in a widespread fashion? Such privilege is part of a perceptual tradition, an accustomed way of seeing and interpreting built up over time by the way people live together, what they value, what they look at, and what they don't see. Mark Rifkin calls this settler common sense the way non-native settler colonial subjects rely on framings of the world that normalize settlement as the background truth against which experience of the world is interpreted and thereby render other possible framings of time, justice, and resistance illegible. Of course, we all rely on the existence of some already established facts and procedures in our daily dealings with each other. Uh, and we do that so that we can focus on what's new and challenging rather than having to reinvent every wheel. That sometimes means that we forget to notice that much of what we accept as given is not really given, but rather is stipulated and then adhered to in largely unthought ways over time. In our daily lives, common sense presents many, our choices to us, many of our choices to us as if they were simply how the world works, and so we don't always notice that they are choices and that things could be otherwise. Another part of the problem resides in how settler colonial histories get told as the progressive realization of an inevitable expansion, obscuring other possible tellings. We might call this a lapse, a failure of memory or a piece of a larger picture gone missing. When a story of settler inhabitation is told as preordained or unproblematically legitimate, there's much that must remain outside of that frame. Here's an example set in the 19th century US, but connected to the present moment in a, by a continuous thread. Lapse occurs when the 1862 Dakota War is described by settlers as criminal behavior by natives rather than as sovereign self-defense in the face of longstanding injustice. Settler common sense perceives native self-determination as a temporal aberration, 
as if challenging white settlement were a refusal to live in the present moment or a failure to recognize a future assumed by settled settlers as inevitable. Settlers think this way at least in part because nothing in their perceptual tradition allows them to see the decades long slow motion onslaught of injustice and deprivation that leads up to the Dakota War. So there's the official colonial story of acquiescence and disappearance that would be countered by the way in which uh, the Dakota people would say that they neither acquiesced nor disappeared. All I'm pointing out is that um, all of us are trained about, about where to look and what to see when we look where we look, and it's possible to, to learn how to think otherwise. Section two is called lapse. It's important to notice what's negative about a lapse. Settler colonial ways of perceiving and inhabiting worlds fail to acknowledge and remember and appreciate and honor as equal indigenous lives and indigenous ways of world building, and that's an ethical failure with deadly consequences. It's also important to draw attention to what may be positive about a lapse. A lapse, when identified, stands as evidence that no system is universal. It points to something missing from a commonly accepted picture. No regime and no perceptual tradition encompasses all truth, and so the unintelligibility of some ways of thinking may have positive value, pointing us towards resources and modes of resistance that already exist or that are struggling to come into being. Change can emerge from sites like that, uh, Precisely because any form of thinking is a result of training and not the reflection of an unchangeable nature, subjects trained to think inside of one tradition can listen for what that system cannot contain. So lapse is not only negation, but has its positive value. So speaking of dominant framings, what is the lapse that allows settler citizens to consider themselves unproblematically free on land that is legitimately theirs, and what might productively interrupt that certainty? Legitimate ownership in this context is granted by law, but the law is built on a deep history of expropriation. Learning how to see that may help people think differently about what it means to dwell together on land, um, and to and, and, or, or possibly teach us to admit that land's provenance can't be <coughs> determined entirely by property law, just as time's passing can't be contained in one temporal rendering without showing signs of a lapse. Section three is called Dugamook. If there were time, I'd go into the rich series of stories that were told by women and men who testified during the Dalgamook versus British Columbia trial. The stories, when heard well, impart a, a broad range of rules, history, spirituality, geography, and cultural norms and aspirations, all of which may not be separable in the same way that they may be separable in North American settler colonial traditions. So that should have been an interruptive moment. In court, oral narratives were, were used uh, as evidence that the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en houses ought to be granted so sovereignty over or title to their land, whereas in the lives of these indigenous peoples, the oral narratives are title, or there's something close to the, to the legalist concept of title. And that point, and many others, should have stopped everyone in their tracks and sent them scrambling to understand the difference. The oral narratives told as testimony in this case support norms against treating nature with disrespect, establish control over portions of land and reasons for moves, moves to other sites, and provide information on land ownership over time. The ownership is also a Western legalist term. It should be possible to recognize these stories as legal materials, even if they don't conform to legalist expectations about evidence or settler colonial assumptions about how narrative works. I wish I had more time to say things about that. My point for now is that it should be clear to anyone who truly listens that these stories exist in order to bring into being and then sustain a world, much like Western law does for many settler colonial citizens. But it's important to note that, the, that these stories inhabit time differently and aim to build a different kind of world. Learning to hear them is one way that settler coloni colonial narratives might get interrupted. But how might we dislodge the certainty of someone entrenched in a settler understanding of law and procedure such that a story about a powerful bear or goats who make themselves look like humans could be heard as world building accounts corresponding to legal title to land. It won't be easy. Um, consider this interruption coming from the side of domination. In the courtroom, after presenting all of the ad hoc based evidence, and the ad hoc is a, a name for Gitkasan oral histories, um, the lawyer for the plaintiffs asserts that the ad hocs are told for the truth of their contents. The judge interrupts with this question, quote, well, do you advance Mrs. Johnson's evidence about the destruction of the village by a supernatural bear as proof of that fact? End of quote. The lawyer for the plaintiffs insists, quote, it's clear from the evidence you've heard that the spirit world, the animal world, and the human world in many aspects of history are interrelated, end of quote. 
It does not seem to be cl clear to the judge that this is so. He responds, quote, up till now, we've been proceeding on the basis that if the witness says it's part of the ad hoc, then it's taken to be part of the ad hoc. And that's the difficulty I'm having. I've heard evidence of, of what I would describe, and I don't say this pejoratively, but the closest thing that comes to my mind is mythology. And if the witness says it's part of the ad hoc, am I bound by that? End of quote. The judge can't imagine himself being bound by what he calls mythology, what a more generous reader might recognize as a different cultural expression of history, law, and social norm making. At the same time, he never questions the conditions of production of the history, law, and social norm making over which he himself presides. And if he did question it, he might come to see that modern law is as much of a mythology as is the story of the supernatural bear that he cannot make himself hear. This certainty about jurisdiction allows him to rule that the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en peoples lacked, claim to, uh, lacked standing to claim existing rights because their rights had been extinguished by, uh, by Canadian law prior to the 1982 Constitution Act. Um, and that makes my point about laps. He believes that sovereignty could declared by settlers means legitimate rule, even if the lands claimed were already inhabited by societies who did not sign treaties or lose battles. There isn't time to discuss this, but the Supreme Court ruling in this case changes things, and I consider it to be a good ruling that, because it does not free itself from colonial narratives, is also in some ways a bad ruling. Section four is called logic. This leads us back to the lapse with which we began. I said that a lapse is negative. It's a piece of time or a different temporality missing from an account smoothed over to look seamless. But a lapse also has positive resonance. It points to something missing if we learn to look for it. We'll find lapse in any account of settler colonial history that frames territorial expansion as always already inevitable or requires that indigenous truths must reside in a timeless past or dictates what the terms of citizenship or the terms of tribal membership can be or educates indigenous children in residential schools, or attaches self-determination to Western legal ideas about sovereignty and land ownership, and so on, laps as a feature of settler colonial truth. We like to think that failures of communication reside with the speaker, and that any failure to, means that the she who speaks ought to learn to do better. But when we know more about perceptual traditions and the forms common sense may take, it becomes clear that sometimes no space is made for hearing, and so the fault may lie with the one who thought she was listening, or the fault may lie in the way human beings adhere unthinkingly to structures where certain kinds of speech may not be heard. A colonial court declaring it has jurisdiction to decide whether indigenous groups have jurisdiction over their own lands is one such faulty space. So let me make a point about reasoning or logic. That a system is a totality and yet has an outside may appear to logic as a problem. So you might say, how can something be total and yet not include something? Or how can indigenous, indigenous, indigenous groups have sovereignty if they're part of a North, North American sovereign? But that is only a problem within that system. If instead you're aiming to show that no system is a totality, that there is no such thing as a totality that contains everything, then the, then the objection that, it, that it's weird to find a surplus to a, talita, to a totality can't make sense. So a philosopher or a lawyer might say to me, you can't expect me to accept an argument that defies logic. Um, and, and, I, and I might say, why do you assume that there's only one logic? So to relate this to the problem of settler common sense, you say this is how we've always done things and I'm skeptical of the truth value of your statement, not because I don't believe in facts, but because I'm aware of how the colonial frame limits what words mean in the phrase, this is what, how we have always done things. My sense of what logic dictates and what words mean gets interrupted by a competing temporality and that's interruption of the technology of justice. All right, my final section is called time and I'm running out of it. Okay, I've been, I've been saying that there are multiple temporalities at play when we subject indigenous worlds to colonial rules, but I haven't been very specific about what that means. One way to think this is in the form of a question. What would it mean to call a history of law that retrospectively authorizes theft and lawless, lawlessness for some at the expense of others, a shared history? Rifkin observes that, quote, for things to be simultaneous, they must be situated within a single frame of reference, end of quote. If that's true, does native dispossession really happen in the same time as settler claims to property? Do lawsuits seeking indigenous jurisdiction over territory never ceded really happen in the same time as settler colonial court rulings that have every confidence that it is within their jurisdiction to decide? I've tried to show that a structure of lapse for those who learn to look for it may produce subjects who encounter unintelligibility and see in it a sign that more work needs to be done, that something other than what is expected is there, and that we may Ha need resources not readily available from within our own traditions um, in order to understand it. 
knowing how to recognize how we have not been prepared to uh, interpret the ways of other traditions opens up possibilities for navigating time in its shared and unshared dimensions. And that potentially op opens up vast possibilities for decoloni decolonizing thought. And I'll end with just one possibility. If we think of linear progressive time not as the only truth about time, but instead as a structural position, a, stru a structural presupposition embedded in a particular frame, then what it means to inherit a past changes. For instance, the fact that the past cannot be undone does not prove that time is linear. Rather, our belief that time is only linear narrows for us what we think can be done about the past. That matters because at every moment in the long story of history, be between uh, the, the long story of relationships between settlers and indigenous peoples, including this moment, different narratives and outcomes were and are possible. Every tradition is a set of beliefs and practices underway and held in place by structures of habit, rule, and tradition, but anything that is underway can also be interrupted.